you know, I've worked on environmental issues now for 43 years, not quite as long as uh, Dick Ottinger, but uh, a long time. And uh, one of the things that has become very clear to me uh, is that we're losing. The environmental movement, as we define it, uh, gets stronger and bigger and more members and more resources, and we're still on the, you know, losing the, the war. We're losing the battle to save the planet, uh, and, and things are slipping out of control. And uh, the climate issue is, you know, the front runner in this, uh, this possibility of, of actually ruining the planet in the lifetimes of today's young people. Uh, but there are other huge problems, uh, biodiversity and a host of other things that are, are out there. And so what uh, I began to do was to start to think, why? How could this, what is the source of this paradox? And, um, and you know, why do we uh, find ourselves uh, uh, at this point, with the largest uh, ecological footprint per capita among the 20 uh, advanced democracies, with the worst score on the environmental performance index among the top 20 democracies. You know, how could this happen? And, and my conclusion is that we've been dealing with uh, kind of the immediate effects on the environment with our programs of air and water pollution and now trying to get at the climate issue. And we haven't been digging deeper and attacking the root causes of these problems. And uh, in the early days, uh, I was doing some readings back of Barry Commoner and the early Paul Ehrlich and the early uh, John Holdren, who's now been for six years our president science advisor. And they were saying things that were deep in terms of calling for change. And uh, I think we've got to go back and rediscover uh, that literature and those ideas. Uh, you know, the challenge to, to economic growth as the be all and end all of, of national policy, particularly when it's measured by this terribly flawed GDP measure, which just adds up all the good, the bad, and the ugly and uh, calls it growth. Uh, and we've got to look at our consumerism uh, and we've got to look at our political system. So I want to sort of begin there by just saying that, you know, that's, in my view, the, the tremendous social inequities in our society, the, the tremendous uh, failures of our politics, our, our uh, rampant materialism and consumerism, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and our just neglect of, of things uh, of our communities. Uh, uh, that these are the real root causes of our environmental problems. So I've been gravitating away from the organized, the traditional environmental community and, and trying to put in what little help I can be to, to groups uh, like New Dream. And uh, I would, you know, I, when I look at these, um, when I was doing my book, I looked at the, not just at our environmental performance, but at our performance as a country uh, in, in a whole host of areas. And I looked, did I do that? Uh, I, I probably did. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know how to retrieve it. Um, I, um, the blue sky. Okay, I've, I've got to get there. I've got to, got to go through the abyss first. Then we'll blue sky. Um, but I looked at all these, uh, you know, I took these 20 countries and I looked at 30 different indicators of, uh, of national performance and of well being. You know, and, and we stink. We're at the bottom on all of them. You know, in addition to the ones I just mentioned about environment, we have the most poverty, the most inequality, the lowest social mobility, some of the worst educational performance. And I won't even talk about all the health indicators where we're at the bottom, even though we pay the most money, by far. Uh, and so when you look at this whole array uh, of failure, uh, really, uh, what we've uh, allowed, in a sense, our company, country to, to our company, uh, 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 our country uh, to become, uh, you know, I, I come to four conclusions uh, from, from that. Uh, you know, one is uh, that we need to come together around a new positive vision, a new American dream. Uh, the old dream, uh, as it's been uh, polluted, uh, is, is giving us the wrong answers, the wrong aspirations, uh, and leading us into this runaway consumerism that we see and uh, uh, are constantly bombarded with. Um, we need a, a positive vision uh, of an America uh, like the one that Wendy uh, described. Uh, an America where the real priorities are people and place and planet. 
and, and not profit and production and, and power projection uh, around the world. And we need to build a new economy uh, to get there. And, uh, but we aren't going to get anywhere along that path unless we come together around a, a very positive and powerful vision of the country that we would actually like to leave uh, to our, our grandchildren. Um, the second conclusion that I think follows inevitably uh, is that with all this gridlock in D.C. Uh, and uh, the terrible state of our sort of national politics, uh, we need to start building where we can go forward, and that's primarily at the local and regional levels in, in our communities. And, um, and, and there's so much going on in the country today alone in these areas, uh, and I, I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a second. Um, but, uh, you know, we need to bring the future into the present uh, in our places that we live and in our families, and, uh, and, and provide inspirational models that, that begin to make this dream come alive uh, in, 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 in everyday life. And so people can see that there is indeed an alternative. There is indeed a better future. There is a better world that we can build because it's happening uh, uh, primarily you know, locally. Uh, the third conclusion that I think uh, follows inevitably is that you know, we, regardless of anything else, we have to get serious about the climate issue. I mean, real serious, real quick, uh, because this issue has the potential for becoming, you know, having effects that are so destabilizing on societies and on natural systems and human systems that in, unless we deal with it, we, we could enter uh, more quickly than, than I think we anticipate uh, an era of, of climate chaos where, uh, you know, Amartya um, Sen, who I actually saw walking through the airport the other day, uh, says that, uh, you know, human freedom is the expansion of, of options, the expansion of opportunities, and the ability to realize uh, those opportunities. And, and what we are, are facing with this threat of climate change is having huge areas of choice and opportunity closed down. Because, you know, coping with the effects of climate change, if, if we allow it to, to get out of control, which we're, I think, on the verge of doing, is, is something that will just consume vast amounts of, of time and energy and could go spinning off in some very bad directions politically. I was talking to Dick Ottinger a moment ago. That they, there, there's a group, the Center for American Progress, that keeps book on, on the climate denials in, in Washington, the deniers in the Congress. And... Uh, the, the, you know, there are 30 members of the U.S. Senate that uh, a, a majority uh, of the Republicans who are, are on record as denying the reality of the climate issue. And there are 144 members of Congress. Again, over half of the Republicans in the Congress. I don't want to pick out Republicans to pick on. Uh, well, I do really, but... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, but it, it is, this is true, and they, they couldn't find any Democrats who were taking that position, but we're stymied on this issue right now, and it has to be dealt with nationally, as well as locally, as well as internationally. Uh, but so we, I, that's the, the third conclusion. And the fourth conclusion that I think follows from all of this is that it, you know, we need to, uh, to tackle our, our politics. We need, uh, we need an era of, uh, of pro-democracy political uh, reform. And, uh, and, and without that, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to get to America the possible. We're not going to get to that new uh, American dream. Uh, so the good news, uh, and I just would say that uh, one interesting thing that I'm talking about these days somewhat is the is that you may have, uh, if, I don't know how many of you watched the Colbert show, but you may remember that when he had his super PAC, uh, he had this uh, uh, charming gentleman uh, named Trevor Potter come on and advise him on uh, his legal advisor. And, uh, and, and Trevor Potter, it turns out, was a former chairman of the Federal Elections Commission. And he has now worked uh, with an organization to draft a, um, a, a proposed legislation called the American Anti-Corruption Act. It doesn't try to stop money from going into politics, it says that the Supreme Court is not going to let that happen, probably anyhow, so they just, but what he says is, is that we ought to build a national consensus to push the Congress to adopt a rule that if you sit on a committee that regulates a certain sector, you cannot take money from that sector, by gosh. <laughs> so if you're on the 
you know, the uh, finance committee, you can't take money from the banks. And the, the whole, so it's perfectly constitutional. Uh, and, it, and, and it's, I think, the best avenue we have for, for dealing uh, with these issues. Now, the important thing, the, the important point I, I want to make is that if you look at these four things, these four imperatives that I've mentioned to you, uh, you know, the New Dream is, is a leader already, despite its uh, modest resources and uh, fresh start in these areas, is a leader already on the first two. Um, they have done really excellent work uh, on, um, on creating uh, this vision uh, of a new America uh, and, um, and, and, and have sponsoring work to, to try to define a new American dream. I looked at this issue of, of what is the American dream once and, uh, and, and I've, you know, it's very contested. It started with the whole you know, uh, pursuit of happiness. Well, what is happiness? You know, what we now know from the field of positive psychology is that you know, happiness is, is not to be found in more stuff. Uh, in fact, a leader in that field said, uh, quote, uh, you know, uh, materialism is toxic to happiness. And this is something Julie has, has written about and knows well. So what does make us happy? They asked a leader in the field uh, recently to say very concisely what the source of, of, of human happiness, uh, what's, you know, what makes uh, high levels of life satisfaction. And, and, and he said, other people. You know, it's our relationships, it's our opportunity to have those relationships in supportive uh, lifestyles, in supportive environments, it's caring for each other, it's being cared for by other people, and that, that's the root of, of human happiness. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with materialism, and it doesn't have anything to do with consumption. Consumerism is just a false idol, right? You go out and try to satisfy, you know, non-material uh, human needs, deep needs by buying more stuff. Uh, and we're, you know, we're told all the time if you, oh, how many ads did we see in the World Series that if you buy that Chevrolet, you're really gonna be that person uh, who was in the ad, that, that wonderful man uh, who we kept seeing um, during, this, during the uh, World Series. Um, so I think uh, another duality that has been in this uh, American dream issue is this, you know, is this, this uh, is, it, is it wealth, uh, should, is it the gospel of wealth, uh, social Darwinism, and, and uh, or, or is it what, um, you know, James, uh, the, the whole concept comes from James Truslow Adams, who uh, uh, wrote, and I'm trying to find it here, um, when he first used the phrase, uh, an American dream, uh, he says, it's not a dream of motor cars and more wages merely, but a dream of a social order in which each person, each man and each woman, uh, shall be able to attain to the fullest stature that which they are innately capable and to be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances uh, of birth or, or position. And that was the original formulation. We got so far uh, away from that. And the third sort of duality that uh, is in this American dream thing is, the, is this uh, duality of uh, whether it's a lifestyle that revolves around consumption or it's one that embraces uh, you know, plain and simple living. And, uh, and, and so this issue of consumption is really cuts through all of these different arguments about uh, uh, the new dream and, and finding a way uh, to live more simply uh, to live uh, in a way where our consumption is conscientious, is collaborative, is caring. Uh, it's really that part of life uh, and not consumerism. Uh, and I think this is, this is the, the, the core importance of the Center for a New uh, American uh, Dream. And um, the other area where they have pioneered, uh, and I've been you know, cheering from the sidelines, so I can't take any credit, is the whole idea of uh, of reviving life at the local level. Um, and uh, and if these reports that are mentioned in the materials that are around the walls, I would encourage you to, to, to look at the, the videos, but um, 
you know, the Guide to Going Local is really a strong publication with a lot of good ideas drawn from a lot of great things that are happening in our country and a, and a way that engages people in replicating those things and building on them and experimenting uh, at, the, at the local level. So this is uh, uh, why I would, you know, hope that all of us could become a you know, strong constituency. Uh, for New Dream. This is, it, it's, it's an organization that is aimed squarely at, at uh, you know, two of the four big things uh, that I think we've, we've got to do uh, right now. So thank you very much. And